We are not really moving because we stay in Valdor. Philippe, bienvenue. Entre en scène. Et um, Philippe, is a, Philippe Chartier is the CEO and founder, one of the founders of Cartier Resources. And we will hear more about Valdor and about the company. Please start. Uh, we'll jump right into the capital structure. We have 218 million shares outstanding uh, over 15 years. Uh, you can see that a uh, large part of the share distribution is um, Agnico Eagle, the Quebec funds, uh, Jupiter Asset Management, Ruffer, and SSI. So that's about over 45%. I own 5 million shares. I've been buying through in the market throughout the past 15 years. So I align my interests with those of our shareholders. And uh, we also have a uh, great mention uh, long term shareholders that own 33%, two groups of um, relatively rich gentlemen in, in Montreal and Val d'Or. So, very little retail out there. And uh, last thing I want to mention $6.5 million in cash. We operate in the Quebec portion of the Abitibi Greenstone Belt, essentially in two areas. Uh, the first area along the, the Cadillac Fault, just like Jose mentioned, uh, along Val d'Or and Rouen. And the second part in the emerging mining industry of, uh, of uh, Cisco Mining. You can see, um, I'd like to, is this the, no, I don't have a pointer, do I? Well, you can see the windfall deposit off there to the uh, top right. We had a very busy year. We've worked on the Chimo Mine project, essentially delivering a third resource estimate, uh, a few engineering studies. Uh, those were positive, and so there, we've launched uh, into the uh, PA process and potentially also the permitting. We've also did a relatively aggressive program on the Benoit, where we still wait for results. They should be out soon. Fenton, we acquired 100% of the deposit from the government, repatriated all the information, and um, we've launched an aggressive exploration program just uh, a few weeks ago. And finally, we were able to option our Wilson project to a, a junior company where they're drilling as well. Highlights on uh, the Chimo Mine project, combined two million ounces of gold in the indicated and inferred category, um, over 20 million tons of relatively th three grams per ton gold. We also delivered an industrial sorting or ore sorting study that shows that we could pre-concentrate over 50% of the material and uh, by doing so, increase uh, the concentration of the grade by about 170%, which has an impact uh, if you want to reduce the transportation cost and uh, deliver higher grade ore to the uh, local mills. And then finally, we also delivered a uh, shaft haulage capacity uh, report that shows that we could throughput uh, uh, between 6,000 and 8,000 tons per day in the, in the current shaft. And we also did stope design and uh, mine scheduling. All of that led to, obviously, in-house uh, a positive outlook, and that's why we launched the PEA. A bit of historics on the Chimo mine. It produced three times in the past with three different uh, gold producers. Uh, Chimo gold mines in the 60s, they were actually mining half an ounce material. And then in the 80s, uh, Luvem came in and they pushed the grade down to six grams, but increased the number of ounces. And then finally, Cambior uh, produced uh, just uh, under 200,000 ounces of gold, and they pushed uh, the grade down to 3.8. Uh, and even in mid-90s, they discovered underground bolt mining uh, approach. Same image. On the left, you could see the old Chimo mine. And on the right, you could see the the results of our internal engineering studies, the mine design, the, uh, the stope design, and uh, that is what convinced us to, um, to launch the PEA. Keep in mind that the, the part on the left, uh, the gold environment at that time was a price of gold of about $400. There's a shaft there that goes down to 920. The major portion of the production, they did not have a mill on site. Uh, they were toll milling before they constructed the mill. In, in one of the scenarios that we're, con that we're considering today, then obviously uh, the numbers look even better when we use the existing mills along the highway. And we were also looking to repeat the process. So for the last three years, we essentially concentrated on the Chimo Mine project. We put 50,000 meters of diamond drilling, 124 holes to deliver those 2 million ounces and to migrate us towards the PEA and, and also launch the permitting. 
In the last year, we've launched uh, the pro uh, programs on all three of the repeat projects, Benoit, Fenton, and Wilson. I'll walk you through them very slowly. Benoit, we started the year by publishing a maiden resource estimate of just under 250,000 uh, ounces. Our objective with the program, the way it was designed, was to measure or, or determine, does this con thing continue at depth? And can we repeat this deposit laterally to the east and to the west? Uh, the answer is yes. At depth, the deposit does continue. You can see uh, an image of the core there. We're getting zones that are you know, 30 to 50 meters wide of uh, pyrite and uh, sericite stringer zones. Uh, we're not seeing as much as uh, calcopyrite. We should have the results uh, by the end of the month, and we'll be announcing those. The holes in blue to the east and west uh, will follow, and uh, they barely tested some of the anomalies that we have. And the drills uh, ended uh, end of September, early October. On Fenton, as I mentioned, we acquired 100% of the project. We expanded the project to the northeast to now include a drill tested showing of um, 386 grams per ton in a drill hole. The, the difference between a Fenton project and the Benoit and Chimo is that it outcrops at surface. And it's going to be a lot of uh, shallow drilling. Um, just off to the uh, northeast of the Fenton deposit itself, we recently identified uh, an ounce and a half a ton material of gold over a meter, which was contained in a really wider uh, mineralized system of um, 4.2 grams over 27 meters. Um, we decided to do the line cutting and the geophysics to help us pinpoint the diamond drill targets. As you can see on the screen, that's a piece of uh, previous Fenton uh, pro, um, deposit drill core, and the system is heavily mineralized, but there's also a high component of silica. Uh, the, the geofix that you see on screen is a historic IP, so we're running DPM uh, surveys in Finitem to help us uh, map out where our targets are going to be. And so the geophysics is in progress, and the drilling will follow suit. On Wilson, uh, our partner have initiated drilling. They completed 28 holes, 5,000 meters, and they reported partial results, and you can uh, see on their website, 17 grams over four meters and 11 grams over three meters. So we're gonna monitor the uh, additional results on, on that project as well. Uh, finally, the reward catalyst for a company like Cardsay, well, obviously is going to be what happens next with, uh, with Chimo. And uh, so it's an entirely different gold environment or gold price environment than it was 25 years ago. Uh, technically, mining and metallurgy is, is entirely different from that uh, period as well. So it's an undeniable fact that we're in the right location. We have um, quality workforce, infrastructure, so the project should earn its merits uh, in the following year. And finally, uh, other things that can move the stock are results on Benoit and on Wilson, the next uh, round of uh, exploration on Fenton, and finally some other projects that we're trying to advance. If I was to put this on a loose uh, timeline, I have two things that are advancing on the Chimo mine project. One, it's a solid line. That is the PEA process. It's out of our hands. And the dotted line, well, that is um, the permitting process that we might launch uh, parallel to that. On Benoit, once we get the results, we see where we go from that. Do we do another mineral resource estimate? Do we go back for drilling? Uh, do we stand still on it? That's up for grabs. Fenton, we've already launched that process. So it's a continuous process, line cutting, geophysics, and then drilling. Wilson, it's out of our hands because it's our partner. And Genex, well, we're always monitoring either to acquire new projects, new deposits, and essentially ready for any M&A that's coming our way. So that's it. Yeah, Philippe was quite fast. We have time for questions. Yes, I do. Um, and it's a very good question. And I take, for example, Canadian Malarctic and Detour uh, that were discovered in the early 2000s. Um, Every cycle, there's excitement around a given area. And when I graduated, it was Voisey's Bay. And then when, and when, when the recent uh, 2000 cycle occurred, there was actually three exploration hotspots, Eleanor, 
detour and Canadian malarctic. So our friends at Cisco Mining in the windfall area, you know, that area just appeared out of nowhere, yet that thing had been explored in the 1980s. Um, so it's, it's, not, it's a question of also timing. It's a question of the market appreciation that this district gets. It doesn't get explored on a continuous basis with the amount of money it should get explored. But when the right amount of money and the right people explore it, they just keep discovering, all right? In the last decade, there were 10 deposits that were delineated, permitted, brought into production in the Abitibi belt alone. And they were brought into production by small companies and big companies. The one common denominator between these deposits is not one of them was a new discovery. They were all they, they were all old projects that had been shelved and they were waiting for the right time. Your project Marban is an example. The Windfall project is an example. The Goldex mine, which was purchased by Agnico Eagle in the 1980s and then shelved because the price of gold wasn't right or the mining technique wasn't there. And today it's operating right downtown Val d'Or. So the, the answer to your question is yes, there will be continued exploration success. There will be continued development uh, there will be continued, you know, mines being put into production in the area. And the, the main reason for that is infrastructure, qualified workforce, and a tremendous proactive fiscal support by the government. Does that answer your question? Um, can you tell us something about the permitting process? Um, we saw it on the chart for Chimo. Yeah. How long will this take? What do you think? Permitting is not long, it's just that it's, it's, and it's not really complex, it's just that it has to follow its, its due course. So permitting and getting an, a, 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 a thing in, in, into, into production is, is just a question of a year or two. And, and you don't have to wait till the final permit is delivered to actually get operated. Uh, in a lot of cases, you will look at uh, Cisco uh, Mining. They're actually underground and doing their work, and they're operating, I believe, on an expiration uh, permit, uh, underground permit. Uh, they, and, and they're in parallel, they're running the full permitting. So as Jose points, pointed out, in Quebec, there's tremendous support, and it, it's, um, and the government officials actually help you, so you could get this done under a year uh, or a year and a half. Okay. PEA. Yeah. You have a resource about a little bit more than two million ounces. Yep. Um, do you have a scenario you can tell us? What do you think? Yeah. About the PEA. How much can you tell us today? <laughs> Listen, when 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 a junior company launches a PEA or a feasibility study, you can already guess that their in-house numbers or their in-house engineering points to very positive results, or else it wouldn't even walk down that path. Um, but I think uh, our predecessors, I think Jose and the guy at Western Copper did point out the fact that the market doesn't, is not, you know, the market doesn't appreciate these things. I, I think the best case uh, was just at the beginning of the week, Walbridge put out uh, a, a maiden resource estimate on their fin alone project. 4.4 million ounces, right along the detour trend. And the market punished them with a 20% drop. I mean, there's a disconnect between the retail market's expectations and what most junior mining and exploration companies actually deliver, which is above and beyond what they originally had expected they would deliver for a project. How do you reconcile that? that expectancy in the retail market with the delivery of the juniors? I can't answer that question. But I can tell you that the CEOs today that are sitting on ounces in the ground have cash in the bank that is being ignored by the markets. The only thing I could tell you is what Paul Penna, the founder of Agnico Eco, once said in a conference like this, gold in the ground does not rust. And when juniors sell their assets at a discount, it's either because they don't understand the value of what they hold or they're aching for cash. 
So if you're invested in a junior that knows the value or understands the value of its assets and has cash, be patient. Because the, mark, the weakness that you see in a lot of junior stocks today is actually a reflection of the impatience of certain retail investors. Indeed, but the, the retail, when they act on your stock, you know, it's, it could be minimal. When an institution decides to act on your stock and they bail big time, you have to, you, you, it's, like, it's like when you're a father or a grandfather and your kid or grandkid goes through a tantrum. You just have to weather the storm. <laughs> and I am a father and a grandfather. <laughs> okay. Yes? Well, the thing is, um, okay, the reason I mentioned the silica is at Fenton, it's obvious that the gold is connected to the presence of sulfites. But there's also a generation of silica flooding within that sulfite. Now, in, in our business, we, either use, we have to adapt the geophysics to what we're looking for. Um, IP is really a, a relatively thin skin, a depth of penetration of about 100. And IP does not measure conductivity. IP measures chargeability, which is an interface phenomenon. So it doesn't measure the volume of sulfides. So if the best example I give is a rubber balloon. If I rub a, a rubber balloon on my head and I stick it to the wall, it adheres. What you're seeing there is a chargeability phenomenon, electron plating on a surface. That's what IP measures. Now I ask you, would you, would you drill that as an anomaly? No. So that's what happens on Fenton. There's a lot of sulfides, and so now we're going to look at it with what we believe is an appropriate geophysical method, which is measures conductivity, and it can see the sulfides at depth. We don't prospect with a drill. Whenever we approach a project, we want to do the least amount of drilling for the maximum results. We manage our cash that way. So that's why I mentioned the silica with the sulfides. We know where the gold is. We know how the silica can you know, mask the, the, the true signature of what we're looking for. So we're adapting the method to do it. So it's more measuring. Uh, absolutely. It, it's, it's the carpenter's approach. Measure twice, cut once. I've, I've done that with expensive pieces of wood and then said, shit. Have to go back to the hardware store, buy more people, you know. Okay, if there are not more questions, I will say thank you very much. Thank you. you.